Oh, we're rolling. Okay. And we have. Some. Um, you said, Jason, that um, doing a film like this gives you a perspective on modern times. What did you mean by that exactly? Well, I find modern life very challenging. I've got two little children, and I'm sure that I'll be held to account uh, for all the things that I'm not doing, all the rationalizations I make. So can I justify to them, to myself, that these things were made in China or India uh, under circumstances that I would never allow or approve if I saw them? Can I justify that I haven't been trying to topple my government when they've been torturing people and throwing away the Geneva Convention? Can I justify flying here to talk to you when, you know, all the predictions are that my kids will never know some of the major cities in the world when they're in middle age. I, I don't know, life is a, a constant stream of rationalizations, and that's what this story's about. So then how do you rationalize the behavior that went on in that time when you're, you know, now we're exploring it again, there's so many movies coming out? Well, I, you know, I don't think there are any movies coming out about this period. There are movies coming out about the Holocaust and uh, Nazis and concentration camps. This is about the 30s in Germany. It's more of an ethical thriller. I mean, I watched this. When I first read it and when I watch it, I want to know what on earth Figo's character is going to do next because I have no idea what I'd do. I know what we expect characters in movies to do. We expect characters in movies to grab an AK-47 and take on the Nazis and it suddenly turns into Hogan's heroes. But actually, you know, we showed this film in Eastern Europe and, and nobody in the ex-Soviet bloc expects Vigo's character to raise a finger. They've all lived under regimes like this and they know that you don't do anything. And, uh, and w what have I done? I've been living in America and England under uh, our governments who have invaded countries based on totally false pretexts. I've done nothing. What would you do in those times, do you think, if you were living in those times? How do you think you would have behaved? Well, how do I like to think I'd behave if I was a, a non-Jew in Germany in the 30s? Really doesn't tally with how I think I probably would behave. You know, I've got a mortgage and a wife and two little kids. And, and would I be prepared to risk it all you know, or could I rationalize my way out of it? In the film, at some point, Vigo's character rationalizes, as a lot of people did, that if he joins the Nazi party, if all good people join, all decent middle class people join, then they can dilute the lunatic fringe, the extremes, the fundamentalists. There's a lot of great stuff happening in Germany in the 30s. I mean, the place is just coming to life. It's blooming. Mm -hmm. Buildings are shooting up, and the kids have got youth clubs to go to, and there's music everywhere. And, you know, and then there's some people who've got these rather extreme views at the edge of it. If they could just take care of those, the rest of it, you know, it's a great economic rebirth. I mean, can you imagine a world without literature, without art? I mean, that's well, you know, the, here's kind of the other thing. The Nazis, yeah. Germany in the 30s was, you know, it was a, it's the country of the Enlightenment. Great intellectual uh, advances and scientific advances. And so um, uh, it's very hard. I don't think it's appropriate for me or anybody else to point the finger and say that they know what they would have done then. Very few people did anything. And, uh, and more importantly, I rationalized my way through stepping over homeless people to get to this hotel, to come sit here and talk to you. I've got three spare bedrooms at home. So, you know, uh, I find it, I think it's important that I make sure I'm constantly aware that there is a line in the sand somewhere and try and police myself and make sure I don't cross it before I start pointing out where other people's lines in the sand ought to be. That's a good point, yeah. Now, when you actually, when you were shooting in Budapest, did you explore, did you get to hang out? Oh, well, you know, I, we just did uh, the press for this film in Budapest, and they asked me about Hungary, and all the other actors were saying, oh, it's a beautiful country, and this city's stunning, and I'm sure that that's true, but I was there twice for very short bursts of time. While I was shooting Brotherhood in Providence, I'd fly across, I'd be Morris, I'd fly back, I'd be a Providence gangster, and backwards and forwards. And when I was there in Budapest, I was uh, a German Jew in the 1930s, and I was fully immersed in it, and I have to say, it wasn't a particularly enjoyable experience. And, uh, how come? I, how come it's not enjoyable to be German in the 30s? I mean, no, while you were, you know, sort of trying not to. I spent my life, I spent my days and my nights immersed in diaries and contemporary accounts of uh, people from that time and listening to music from that time to try and keep my head in that space so you don't, I didn't get sucked up into the fun of being on a film set. So uh, whatever experience they all had of Hungary, I had a very different one. Did you feel at all schizophrenic that you, you had to go from playing the gangster to the yeah. good guy? <laughs> yeah, I'd go from uh, this being a thick Providence Irish accent to uh, you know using a, an English accent, and also I'd go from you know slightly psychopathic and sociopathic behaviour to uh, to this guy. It was much more specific. You know, for Morris, I had a chart on the wall of my trailer saying what each of the laws were as one by one, all of my human rights were taken away, and uh, I felt entirely schizophrenic. Yeah, that's true. Now. When you're playing the guy in Brotherhood, how does he seep into your daily life, if at all? 
Oh, I've got a <laughs> wife and two little girls. I don't bring Michael Caffey home at night because I'd be behind bars by now. I know. It's such a fantastic performance. That's very sweet. Really? Look, when somebody gives you the chance to play uh, a brain-damaged, paranoid, schizophrenic, psychopathic crime boss, you, you, know, you grab it with both hands. And uh, can you tell us perhaps what's happening next season? Any sort of... I'm not sure that I can tell you if there is a next season. I mean, this season is on now. It finishes in two weeks' time. And uh, unless there is great public outcry, I, I fear for us next year. Really? I thought, that, I thought the show was a hit and everybody loved it. Well, you know, it. the thing about uh, Showtime, I've been very, very supportive the whole time. And it is a critical hit. And, you know, it won a Peabody Award. And its fans are absolutely obsessed with it. Uh, but I've no idea, you know, my job is to try and make Michael Caffey come to life. Uh, I, I'm no part of putting it on or trying to sell it, but uh, I'm not quite sure that Showtime have had the ratings that would justify them bringing it back. It's up to them uh, at Showtime. I know that, I don't know what much else I could do with Michael. Things have gone about as badly as they could possibly go for anybody. Um, I can't imagine what more ignominy the writers could think of to throw at me. Oh, I'm sure there's much more to be done, I think, you know, in that kind of world. You never know what's going to happen next. Maybe, but every time we leave Providence, every year we say goodbye to each other. We never quite know if we're coming back. It's very sad. How hard is that to shoot away from home, um, especially when you do have kids? Well, Rhode Island is, is the ocean state. It's where a lot of Americans take their annual vacation, and I've been there every year with my wife and kids, and we've, I've rented a house on the ocean. And, uh, you know, the contrast between being Michael Caffey during the day and being this kind of socket out at night couldn't be greater. It's a beautiful place. I've made some really good friends there. And uh, if we don't get to go back, I'll be going back for holidays. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm. Now, do you have another film project in the works? Yeah, well, I just came here from the set of The Green Zone, the Matt Damon thriller that Paul Greengrass is directing, uh, set in the early years of the uh, Iraq War, and it's incredibly high energy and exciting. So uh, that's fun. I don't know when that's coming out, but we just finished it literally yesterday. And, uh, and then there's various British films, hopefully for the new year, but in today's economic climate, until you're actually on the set, and they say, this way, Mr. Isaacs, uh, I'm not sure they're gonna happen. So in this climate, how are you celebrating the holidays? Are you still doing gifts? Are you telling your children no. perhaps no gifts this year? No, no, we're doing, I'm doing Christmas and Hanukkah and anything else I can grab. Because I ha I've hardly seen my kids, what with the various filming, Green Zone and filming Brotherhood and f filming various other things. Uh, I get home when they're asleep and I leave before they wake up, so. Uh, I'm trying to buy my way back into their affection. <laughs> do you have any sort of special family traditions that you do every year? Uh, no, I just, I've been desperate to take my kids to Lapland to meet Santa. That's a trip you can do from London. And uh, I've got friends who've taken their kids there who are now grown up 10 or 11, and they realize there's no tooth fairy, and they realize there's no uh, many other things. <laughs> but they still believe in Santa because they met him. So I'm desperate to take my kids before the disbelief sets in. So Santa still has a job, that's a good thing. Oh yeah, we have Santa, we have Tooth Fairy, and we have the Switch Witch. Switch Witch comes on Halloween, switches out all the candy by the bed for a gift. Tooth Fairy's cousin. <laughs> you can use that. 